I'm Ann Kelly. I direct our BICEP coalition, which is made up of companies who have leaned in, putting their company's muscle behind innovative climate and energy policies and earning a seat at the policy tables at the state and federal levels. Welcome, a special welcome to all of you BICEP companies who are here. We appreciate your efforts. We welcome others of you to join us. And a warm welcome to the rest of you, our associated BICEP supporters. We appreciate all of you being here on this historic breakfast just two weeks after the Paris Agreement was signed. If she could be here now, I know that Administrator Gina McCarthy would thank all of the companies, investors, and coalition members who has stood up to support the Clean Power Plan, the crown jewel of the President's climate agenda over these past 18 months, but in particular over this past year. Unfortunately, Administrator McCarthy is in Flint. Our thoughts are with her. She sends her deepest regrets, and we, we are very grateful to her for her leadership. But I am truly honored that we have Senator Sheldon Whitehouse of Rhode Island here this morning, a stunning climate champion, a senator who in 135 speeches to his Senate colleagues, a series called Time to Wake Up to Climate Change, has spoken on the urgency of the full range of climate impacts from ocean acidification to our dying forests to the effects of rising waters in places like Miami. And in his scathing review of the Wall Street Journal's continued climate denial, Senator Whitehouse has left no turn unstoned. He calls not for serenity, to accept the things we cannot change, but rather to change the things we can no longer accept. While he knows we'll always have Paris, he also knows that the real work is right here at home. And he's committed to effective bipartisan legislation to allow the US to meet the goal we made in Paris. In addition, Senator Whitehouse has co-founded the Bicameral Task Force on Climate Change and the Senate Climate Action Task Force to help build support for action to address carbon pollution. Last year, Senator Whitehouse introduced legislation to put a fee on carbon, establishing a market incentive to reduce emissions while generating substantial revenue to be returned to the American people. In 2011, Senator Whitehouse joined with Democrats and Republicans to form the Senate Oceans Caucus to respond to the pressures of pollution and commercial activity. A graduate of Yale and the University of the Virginia School of Law, Senator Whitehouse served as Rhode Island's US Attorney General before being elected to the United States Senate in 2006. In addition to the Environment and Public Works, he is a member of the Budget Committee, the Judiciary Committee, the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee, and the Special Committee on Aging. He's here with his wife, Sandra, a marine biologist and environmental advocate. Together, they are the power couple of Rhode Island. Whenever I get discouraged about leadership in Washington, DC, I simply think of Senator Whitehouse. We and future generations owe him our deepest gratitude for his courage, his dogged determination, and his steadfast leadership. Please join me in welcoming Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. Well, I did not know I'd be getting the uh, taking care of business background thump music, which is a pretty good way to start the day. But it's a really good way to start the day to be here with uh, Ceres and the BICEP Coalition, because I think that um, this group stands a very good chance of being the most impactful group at breaking through and getting some serious work done in Washington, uh, at least in the legislative branch, on climate change. So, Anne. Thank you, Mindy, thank you, and to all of you who are participating in this, I am very grateful. I'm here this morning to bring you a bit of a report from the ecosystem that I inhabit, i.e. the political system in Washington, and to talk a minute about the question, why is it that in Congress, we are not now sitting down and having an on the merits discussion about how we deal with climate change? And the first question is, how did we get to a point where we're not having that discussion? 
And the second question is, how do we get back on track? The first question can be answered with two very simple observations. The first is that the fossil fuel industry has built a very complex and very robust climate denial apparatus. It probably had its roots in the old days when Philip Morris thought it was being clever by creating an American Tobacco Institute to hide the hand of Philip Morris in tobacco fraud. Well, they've gotten a lot cleverer since then. And uh, you can kind of look back at that as the early fliver and biplane days of the corporate propaganda industry. As people like Robert Brule and Riley Dunlap and uh, Jason Farrell and others have uh, described, there are dozens of groups out there, and they don't call themselves the American Fossil Fuel Institute mostly. They call themselves the Heartland Institute or the George C. Marshall Institute. It is a very, very robust piece of machinery, and it's a, an, an, a foeman worthy of our steel. Um, so we have to be very cautious and attentive about dealing with it. It is for real. The second is Citizens United. Citizens United put howitzers in the hands of special interests where before they'd had pop guns. And the fossil fuel industry was among the very first to take advantage of that new artillery that Citizens United provided them. And so the lobbying effort and the public relations effort is matched by an equally robust political effort. So an Americans for Prosperity says, we have $750 million we're going to spend in this election. And if you cross us on climate change, you are going to be, to quote them, severely disadvantaged, or to quote them again, in political peril. That's a very significant threat. That's a very loud signal through my ecosystem. And what you see as a result is that what was a bipartisan issue through my early years in the Senate, over and over again, exactly coterminous with the Citizens United decision, became a partisan effort. Because in essence, what the fossil fuel industry did was accomplish a hostile takeover of the Republican Party. I can remember giving an early speech on the Senate floor about the Koch brothers and about their influence and their intrusion into this. And a friend of mine on the Republican side came up to me, not somebody you'd ordinarily think of, not one of the five who signed the Graham Pledge, and said, Sheldon, what the hell are you complaining about? They're spending more against us than they're spending against you. That was during the early stages of the hostile takeover. And sure enough, there were times when the Koch brothers and their operation were spending more against Republicans than against Democrats to bring the party under heel. So how do we get back on track from there? Well, the first is we are going to win this because public pressure and the facts are becoming irresistible. And that's an inevitable tide. But if you understand about climate change and about what it's doing to our oceans and atmosphere, you know that there are tipping points and you know that there are points of no return. And so the really important question is, will that public pressure, will the pressure ultimately of facts make enough of a difference? And will it be there in time to turn things around? And that's the unknown question. So we can't just be happy with that fact. We have to keep pushing harder. One way to push harder is to emphasize home state examples. If you are talking to members of Congress about what the IPCC thinks or what the Sierra Club thinks or what climate scientists writ large think, they've tuned that long since out. You have to do a little bit more research and look at what the University of Arizona thinks. Look at what the University of New Hampshire thinks. Look at what the coastal councils of the Carolinas think. Look at what the firefighting season has happened, what, what's become of it in Idaho. You've got to make it local, and there is the rub that makes it really difficult for the denial to continue. The second way we get back on track is that Republicans are ready in the Senate for something to happen when they see a safe path to get there. Talking to my Republican colleagues in the Senate about climate change is like talking to prisoners about escape. The first thing they do is look left and right to see who's listening. The second thing they do is lower their voices. But there are at least a dozen 
who are having regular conversations with me about how you get there. And the most recent group, the Graham Five, was not a group that I recruited. That was a group that Lindsey Graham brought to me. He said, I want to do a good, strong climate resolution. Will you do it with me? I'm going to try to go out and get some Republican colleagues. You pick yours, I'll pick mine. And so we went five and five to keep it balanced, and we have a really strong bipartisan Senate climate resolution initiated from the Republican side. So there are real cracks in the denial castle, and it really is crumbling. So how do we shove it through? How do we complete the collapse of denial castle in time before those points of no return get reached? Here is where the work of Ceres and Bicep and the role of the business community is so important, because the business community has a voice like none other among our Republican friends. The business community, according to reports, does 30 times the lobbying in Washington of anyone and everyone else. So if you're looking at, at lobbying in Washington, you're looking at corporate and business lobbying by a factor of well over 90%. So in that 90%, what's happening? How much of that is being deployed on a climate change message? My answer to you, and I'm afraid to say it, but net zero. And I don't mean carbon net zero. I mean lobbying message about climate change net zero out of the corporate community. And I'm not netting it against the nefarious efforts of the fossil fuel industry. I'm just counting among the good guys. Among the good guys, the lobbying effort in the world I inhabit, that I see day in and day out, nets to zero, if not negative, because of the support for groups like National Association of Manufacturers, U.S. Chamber of Commerce, National Federation of Independent Businesses, Farm Bureau, and groups like that, that for some reason are tied into a denial mode. That ought to be unhinged, but it's not going to happen until the business community moves. This past week, before when we left the Senate, I had three big lobbying meetings. One with, was with TechNet, Apple, Google, clean energy companies, and they had a whole book full of issues for us. Was climate change in that book of issues in any respect? Not mentioned. Not there. Even though there were green technology companies in that, even though these were the great American innovators, zero. I then had the lumber guys come in. Look at what is happening to the forests of the West. I went up to New Hampshire on one of my climate tours, and the lumber industry in New Hampshire is terrified that they're going to be all pulpwood before long because the hardwood trees are migrating north. They're losing the populations of their timberlands. What did the lumber industry have to say about climate change? Not a word. It was not on their agenda. And then I got lobbied by the property casualty insurance industry. Who writes the check when extreme weather wrecks somebody's house? The property casualty insurance industry. They had a list of agenda items. Was climate on them? No. So you get companies that have outstanding climate policies in their fence and that are pressing up the supply chain to drive their excellent climate policies beyond their fence. And then they come to Washington and they completely drop the issue and very likely support lobbying groups that are against them on that issue. So what we see in Congress is net zero effort or less from the good guys in the corporate community on climate change. And as soon as that changes, as soon as Walmart is telling Senator Bozeman of Arkansas, John, we need you, man, and we'll have your back when those clowns come after you. When Coca-Cola is telling Johnny Isaacson, Johnny, we need you on this. Look at all the effort we put into this. Look how serious we are about this. And by the way, we'll have your back when those clowns come after you. That, I believe, is a tipping point difference. So we have, I think, cause for real optimism. The concern has always been, well, we'll stick our necks out and <clears throat> we'll be punished. There'll be retribution. But there is safety in numbers. 
and the corporate community that Ceres and BICEP have gathered and the corporate community that gathered to support the Act on Climate Pledge and the Paris Agreement, that Paris coalition is so big and so strong that it simply redirects its energy, not from Paris, but to Washington. There won't be retribution. There will be consequences, but there'll be the consequences that we want. So I'm here to urge you to get as involved as you can, work through that Act on Climate Pledge group, don't break up the band, put the pressure on us in Washington, give cover to the Republicans who want to do the right thing, but are now only hearing from the worst knuckleheads in the equation. So thank you very much, and I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you, Senator Whitehouse. I want to make sure that I am mic'd. Uh, we're going to learn more about those cracks in the denial of Castle. Welcome to those of you who've just joined us. We are going to have an opportunity to ask questions of Senator Whitehouse, so be thinking about what you'd like to ask him. I'd be remiss if I didn't respond to his call to action by making sure Senator Whitehouse knows and all of you know that BICEP is extremely active in working on Republican colleagues, and much of that work is done confidentially. We are completely committed to a post-partisan world. We wear purple for that reason. On May 24th, we have a reception in Washington. If you're interested in joining to meet with Republican senators, you can talk to my colleague, Katina Songas, who is here. You are all welcome. Much of that work is behind the scenes, uh, but, but we are there, and we invite more of you, and I can't think of a better call to action than that. So. Um, Senator Whitehouse, you mentioned, I'm not sure our audience knows, you mentioned something important about Senator Graham. Could you just remind our audience of what it was that they said in that sense of the Senate amendment and why that was so important? Well, first of all, there was no hesitation about either the reality of climate change or its genesis in mankind's activities. So that was good. We'd kind of been there before, but that was a very strong, it was as strong a statement, if not a stronger statement, than we'd ever gotten a vote on when we'd forced the issue. But the key thing was that they said Congress ought to act. Mm -hmm. And that was a place where no Republican had been before. And so to have five of them move that way was another very significant crack and crumble in the denial apparatus, and it sends a very strong signal to the remainder of the dozen or so who want to go, particularly if they survive mm -hmm. and are protected and don't get the hell kicked out of them, um, that this is, this is politically survivable. This is okay, you can do this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, significant. Talk a little bit about the, you, you alluded to the denial machine. You've talked about it at length. You've been eloquent in your review of the Wall Street Journal. Do you have thoughts on the current Exxon investigation? Many in our audience are actively watching that case. Many attorneys general have joined it now. Possibility that there's been profound material misrepresentations. Any sense of how that's going to shake out and the impact it will have? Oops. I, <laughs> I, completely, up here. <clears throat> I completely love my job. And there are few places I can think that I would rather be, but a contender position would be to be reviewing the discovery in a civil litigation brought into the denial apparatus. Because you know that behind the scenes there have got to be unbelievable emails and memos and things like that that will blow what is, I think, a scandalous propaganda operation completely out of the water. So uh, I watch those with great interest. <clears throat> and um, in this audience, I should add that in response to very small stimuli, mm -hmm. this machinery fights back very, very hard. So I wrote a piece in the Washington Post recommending that RICO investigation be considered, and there were 49 pushbacks in the next couple of weeks. I asked Attorney General Lynch a question about where it had been referred. There were 52 pushbacks in the following weeks. And if you look at them all, they're all traced to the fossil fuel industry and the denial apparatus. They all follow the same script so closely that if there were a central script, they couldn't have been any more uniform. And they all take the position that any attempt to investigate the fossil fuel industry is a shameful and disgraceful intrusion on people's First Amendment rights of free speech. And what's interesting about that argument 
is that it is the exact argument that tobacco made in the fraud case that the government brought against Big Tobacco. They lost it at trial. The finding that fraud is not protected by the First Amendment was powerfully upheld by the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. So they make this argument just baldly ignoring both the law and the history on this very issue. So it begins to look a little bit more like defensive behavior than rational conversation. Also, if they were that head up about uh, the dangers of investigation in the climate arena, uh, where were they when senators were calling on the East Anglia scientists to be criminally prosecuted? Where were they when the, universe, when the uh, Virginia Attorney General was tormenting Michael Mann at UVA so badly that the, UVA, that the university had to take him to the Supreme Court of Virginia to get him to knock it off? So they were silent through all of that. So the, another noteworthy thing about the quarreling over the RICO case is that uh, they seem to be intensely sensitive to investigation when it touches on them, but high degree of equanimity about investigations when it actually goes after a climate scientist. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay. Um, I'm wondering if you have, um, you, you mentioned this key distinction here about individual companies acting and their trade associations acting. And we've got companies in the audience like VF uh, Corporation from North Carolina, Mars from Virginia, yep. uh, several who have been extremely active on Capitol Hill as individual companies. Are you suggesting that as valuable as that is, that the trade association, I heard a funny line last night at dinner, the slowest common denominator instead of lowest. Yeah. Uh, are, are you seeing that the association is just overpowering the efforts of individual viable brands from key states? What's, what's the distinction there? Are, are you almost saying that unless we neutralize those associations, we won't be effective? What's your sense? First of all, I think that individual companies need to step up their game. I have never heard a Republican say that they were lobbied by any corporation on climate change, ever. Um, and in fact, many will say, we know the names of all the fossil fuel guys. They're in our offices all the time. I couldn't name a single person who's ever lobbied me in favor of doing something about climate change. Now, this is what you hear from Republicans? Yes. Okay. Is it possible that they don't want to talk about those? Me I'm just... Not in the circumstances <laughs> in which these conversations are taking place. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. um, because one of the concerns that they're sharing with me is, Sheldon, you got to help get me some support here. And if they were hearing from home state industries, if uh, Burr and, and uh, Tillis were he hearing from VF in a strong way, that VF would really have it, their back if they were good, I think that would affect them. And I think the same is true of, of uh, home, big home state industries and other states where there are Republican senators. So I think that the signal that is sent from individual companies, if it's sent at all, is sent very mildly. And the signal that is sent by the big trade associations is very powerful because it's backed up by their political support. So if a, little, if a company comes in and says, you know, it would be nice if you did something about climate change, and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce says, you do anything about climate change and we're in for your primary opponent all the way. Don't you dare touch that. Mm -hmm. You got clobbered. Right. There's a hydraulics of politics. And if our hydraulics aren't, I think that there's zero on our side, to tell you the truth. Well, I, I might dispute zero and, and we'll wait till we have questions because we've had some very powerful advocates here, including uh, VF Corporation. But that, Let's press this a little bit further. What do you think motivated then uh, Senators Graham, Ayotte, Senator Portman of Ohio, Senator Collins from Maine, those who got on the amendment that you just referred to earlier, if they hadn't been pressed by companies, do you feel as though they are waking up to climate change? I think change? it's or a combination of wanting to be on the right side of an issue where the public has moved dramatically and where their home states are um, not fertile climate denial territory. Lindsay is, I think, a special case. He's unusually brave, he's unusually smart, and he's unusually forward-thinking. Um, the other four are all up for re-election right now mm -hmm. in Ohio, Illinois, New Hampshire, I'm forgetting who the fifth one is. Um, Maine, no. No. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> so they have very strong interests in appearing moderate to the electorates in those states. So they have a, the political impulse that the American public is delivering 
is stronger in their immediate circumstance than it is in other places. And, I mean, my gosh, if you're Kelly out in New Hampshire and you're looking at people who can't do the moose tours any longer because you can't blow snow onto a trail mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and nobody likes to ride snowmobiles through the mud and when you do get to the moose it co is covered in 10,000 ticks and is just a horrible thing to look at mm -hmm. because the snow is no longer killing off the tick population. If you're not paying attention to that, you've got a real problem on your hands. Yeah. And that's just one example. They got the timber industry, they've got the ski industry, wherever, they, wherever she turns, climate change is whacking New Hampshire. Their state bird is looking like it's gonna be moving out the north end up to Canada. They won't even have their state bird any longer if they keep this up, mm -hmm. according to UNH scientists. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit more about your efforts toward bridge building and the, and the tone of the Democratic-Republican debate in this context. Is it, are there forms where you can actually, unlike what we read in the headlines, I mean, are there forms where you can have constructive, comfortable conversations, yes. dinners, parties, golf games, where you can have a serious back and forth, and where the tone is, and, and I'm looking now at those cracks in the denial. Yeah. It, 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 sounds, it sounds to me like you're having some actual constructive conversations. Yes, but they're very, very behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. When I said people look over their shoulders when you talk to them, I'm not kidding. Uh, one of my colleagues said, let's keep having this conversation, but don't let my staff find out about it. Well, you mentioned staffers, and that was going to be my next question. We know a lot of work gets done by staffers, lo and behold. Is there kind of the informal rapport among young staffers who talk to each other? Connect? I think in some cases, yes. but. A staffer who gets his senator in trouble with Americans for Prosperity or with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce by pushing out too far has a real problem. Mm -hmm. So the staffers are not leaning way forward ahead of the members. In my experience, the members are actually further along than the staff. And... Um, even young staffers who are under 30 years old, millennials? You learn not to talk about it. Hmm. I see. They may be in the right place, but there are things that you do and there are things that you don't do. And one of the things you don't do is get your boss in trouble with the big lobby groups by walking them out on a plank that they then saw off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we're going to talk about your reasons for hope in a minute, but let's talk about... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> carbon <coughs> fees, you filed legislation that would put a price on carbon. I'd love to, if you can share with our audience, and by the way, this morning we have a session on uh, the price is right, on, on carbon pricing. Talk a little bit about your thinking around that and why you see that as such a, a bipartisan bridge issue. If you look at all of the Republicans who have gone through the steps of climate change is real, we have something to do with it, it's serious, we need to fix it, and the solution is, every single person gets to the solution is a revenue neutral, border adjustable carbon price. Every single one, whether it's the um, economists like Greg Mankiw and Arthur Laffer, mm -hmm. whether it's the former Treasury secretaries like George Shultz and Hank Paulson, whether it's the former EPA administrators, the former members of Congress and senators, whoever's been out on this and walked it through goes to the same end point. So as long as they've identified that as the tool that they are comfortable with, there's no reason for us to be difficult and say, well, no, we're not going to do it that way. In fact, it's a very, very useful tool, and our bill actually blows the doors off the clean power plan in terms of overall emissions reductions over time. So these are really powerful methodologies when they're brought to bear uh, because they're economy-wide and they're fair and they're neutral and so forth. So for all those reasons, uh, but mostly, you know, <clears throat> when they get ready to make their escape, I want to have a car that they're comfortable with waiting on the other side of the fence to drive away in. <laughs> a Tesla. Whatever. <laughs> And so there's robust conversations going on about what the structure of a carbon fee would look like. Uh, th not directly, mostly through intermediaries. The main issue is how big do you make the carbon fee? 
And then what do you do with the revenues? What, in fact, is revenue neutral? So Arthur Laffer has the view that it's really only net revenue neutral and suitable for his adoption if you're changing marginal tax rates at the margin. Um, so we change corporate income tax rates at the margin. We drop them from 35 to 29 percent, which the Finance Committee could tie itself in knots for months and never accomplish, and we could do it like that. And then we have a big chunk of money that goes back to individuals, but it's an offset against their first $500 in payroll tax. Mm -hmm. That's not lowering the rate at the margin, so at that point we lose Dr. Laffer, but I think it's still good, and it sure is revenue neutral in terms of the money going back. And the last piece is that we leave some money for states so that people can begin to make adjustments in the states. It's really an opening to the coal states to say, look, we can help you with your problem. You could put every coal miner, everybody who ever swung a pick or took the top off a mountain, onto their pensions right now. You could pay, you could make the pensions sound for the retirees whose pensions are not now sound, and we could put everybody working onto their pensions now, retired in place. And it would cost very little money compared to what's at stake here. So there are ways to make the coal communities actually pretty happy if they'd listen. But they're very stubborn, and that's why all the companies have gone off the cliff into bankruptcy. But do you feel as though if they knew there was just transition built into you, the model, you might be able to win over their support, especially we if it included to. retraining? We need to. I mean, these are communities that genuinely are suffering. We shouldn't ignore them. Mm -hmm. And there are states like Wyoming that gets a third of its revenue from coal fees and oil fees and gas fees. So what do you say to the governor of Wyoming when we say, we're going to do something that puts in peril one-third of your state's revenues. Right. There's got to be a way that we help them transition. Mm -hmm. And so you have to set aside a piece of money to help those states, and we give it back to all the states. It's not a federal program. Basically, it's a you sort it out mode. But again, there's question, is that fully revenue neutral or not? So you get into sure. those conversations. But I think politically, that's the way it has to go. And for the corporate community, to have a payday like a one-time reduction from 35 to 29 percent in the top corporate income tax rate that's unachievable any other way, that's a pretty powerful impulse when they see that it's real. As one guy said, right now, Sheldon, that's a unicorn. We <laughs> love it. When it's a horse, we'll ride it. We'll ride it. <laughs> Good. Just one note on the Clean Power Plan. I know you're a supporter of the plan. Absolutely. And I know that you were, thank you for retweeting the news about the companies that signed amicus briefs. And thank you for the companies the that signed the amicus brief. Uh, that was, very impactful. And so my sense is that you don't see these in conflict. In fact, it might be an evolution that if we were to establish a carbon fee, that it could evolve beyond the clean power plan, but that as a starting point, the clean power plan is vital, both for shutting down coal plants and for spurring this robust conversation. Do yep. I have that right? Yes. Okay, good. Absolutely. Terrific. All right, I'm going to ask Senator Whitehouse one more question, then turn it out to you. Uh, your reasons for hope at this point, besides being at the series conference and seeing all these people who are eager to, to work the Hill? The public is there, and the young public is particularly there. So if you're a really smart Republican like Lindsey Graham, mm -hmm. and you're interested in the future of the Republican Party, when a poll gets taken of Republican voters, Republican voters who are under the age of 35, and they're asked about a politician who is a climate denier, and they say in the polling, by a majority, that that politician is ignorant, out of touch, or crazy. Their choice is in the poll, not my words. That's a really strong signal to the party that it has got to line up. And there comes a point where the political power and the money stinking up our politics that has been deployed on behalf of climate denial becomes more apparent and becomes its own argument against itself. Um, and I think that day is approaching very soon. So I think there are a lot of reasons why, and I guess ultimately I'm an optimist at heart and I believe because we absolutely have to get this right, we must, and therefore we will. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, thanks so much. You heard it here. Let's turn it out to you. We have microphones in the audience. Uh, if you don't mind giving us your name and your organization and make sure there is a question mark at the end of your statement. Um, hands up for questions. That's for okay. Us. I'm from Rhode Island. We do comments, rude remarks, <laughs> questions, the whole bit. The full range, okay. The whole range. Great. Uh, questions for Senator Whitehouse? I just can't quite see with the lights. Yes, go ahead, sir. Hand up there. Yeah. Good morning. Um, my name is Tim Smith, and I work with Walden Asset Management, an investment firm. And I just wanted to reinforce your point that uh, uh, who is being heard in the halls of Congress. And I think we see investors as part of the business community, too, so that when we walk into a senator's office, we're speaking as part of the larger economic sphere, too. But I did want to add a point and ask uh, for a comment from you about uh, unusual voices that some uh, senators are hearing from. Uh, we've been part of an ongoing uh, dialogue with Exxon Mobil, with investors disputing with them uh, month in and month out on climate. Um, but one of the things they say is that they regularly do go to Congress, and the person who uh, does that says they always talk about the importance of climate change. Never once. Uh, well, he, he's, I'll, I'll uh, this is Pete Trellenberg who does their energy outlook, and he says he's regularly there. Never heard it once. he's regularly saying that climate's real, it needs to be addressed, and he says ExxonMobil's position on a, on a carbon tax is expressed in those meetings. So, Well, here's we, what's frustrating yeah. about that, because I see the same stuff said in print, and even recently you saw one of the uh, Koch brothers' um, intermediaries <laughs> saying, oh, Charles Koch understands that climate change is real and that human activity plays a, a part in that. What you don't see is that C-suite level statement moving down to any of the vast lobbying apparatus that they maintain. American Petroleum Institute, not a word. U.S. Chamber, not a word. Everywhere where ExxonMobil touches, Congress, the message is exactly the opposite of what is being said. Now, it's nothing new to Congress to have CEOs saying one thing and have their lobbying guys saying, don't believe that. That's for public consumption. It's your ass if you cross us on this. That's where they are right now. The 100% strength of their lobbying organizations and their political organizations is adamantly opposed to doing anything. If they had any support for a carbon price, since it's my carbon price bill, you'd think I'd know about it. And they might have produced one person, just one, to be a Republican co-sponsor. So, but the fact good. of the matter is I think that they're just, it's a game. So they we're, say that. we're with you on, the, on that latter point entirely. We're all over pushing companies to get out of ALEC. We're challenging them the, for the fact that their monies, their dollars, as chamber members are going in to sue the EPA. So you're absolutely right. Yeah. The API, the NAM, the, the yeah. chambers are actively involved. But let's at least hope for the day that enough of us investors can get statements from top level of some of the oil companies and walk in with you to some of those offices and say, I'm putting these on the table. Here are six American oil companies that say climate change is very real. Here's what they're trying to do to address it. And by the way, we need a price on carbon. So yeah. we can, and the, we can, the good we can news is price. that they feel the obligation to say that now, which they didn't before. It may be just frosting on a denial cake that is still full denial, but they felt obliged to frost it. And that's good. Yes. And it's going to continue to collapse thanks to pressure like yours. It's going to continue to move. But don't think because the CEOs have said it that that's worked its way to the bottom. There's a lot of work to do to get Congress to actually hear that effect in any of the ways in which we hear the deployment of corporate influence. Well said. Message well heard. Said. Thanks. Someone left that cake out in the rain. Ryan, question. Hi, I'm Eleanor Lacane with PRN Radio. I recently had dinner with Gro Brundtland, Prime Minister of Norway and Chair of the Brundtland Commission. And she said the greatest thing we can do to stop climate change is to put a price on carbon. Mm -hmm. My question to you is, what is the biggest block to getting carbon pricing, and what are the top three things we can do to get carbon pricing? 
the greatest block is the uh, fossil fuel industry and the climate denial apparatus that it maintains. Um, as I mentioned to the previous questioner, it's going to take a while before all those groups begin to change. They've had a huge investment put into them as climate denial entities, and it's going to be very awkward for a lot of them uh, to shift. And it's not clear yet that the signal from the CEOs is legitimate, that they're not being told, keep doing what you're doing. We'll let you know when, I, when I'm serious. Um, but you're absolutely right that a carbon price is the best way to go because it has such good international possibilities. Trying to match regulatory systems is a nightmare. A matching worldwide carbon price is a very, very simple proposition. And uh, the good work that's being done in Canada on carbon pricing right now sends a very good example to us right across our borders. So I could not agree more with uh, Norway's position. And by the way, they're putting their money where their mouth is with their sovereign fund and disinvesting. So they've been, they may have made it in the fossil fuel industry, but they've really turned a corner in a way that I don't think the companies have. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, right here. Senator, I appreciate your candor. My name's Tom Martin. I'm the CEO of EnviroCirc. We're in the midst of establishing a credit price for both ammonia and methane. Mm -hmm. We can get rid of ammonia and methane from agriculture for the first time in history with a new technology that converts manure lagoons at CAFOs into a benign 99% water environmentally friendly fertilizer that gets rid of all fertilizer on cropland around these CAFOs. And wow. we, met, we met with the EPA yeah. two weeks ago. The AgStar program has been the default for the past 23 years. There are over 8,000 CAFOs in the United States, 240 biodigesters over 23 years have been installed on farms. Yeah. That's an adoption rate of less than 3% and a failed program. It does nothing to benefit the environment. They burn off methane for two weeks and they put the manure back out on the field and it does what it does. We're eliminating manure entirely from livestock operations where there are lagoons. What we're proposing and doing, uh, we've been in touch with leadership at Volkswagen and Sempra Energy. They have a little PR problem. We solve that. What we learned in the past month is that there's something called the SEP program such that when a complaint is filed by DOJ on EPA's behalf, up to 80% of the fines and penalties by, against Volkswagen, for example, can be applied toward beneficial mitigation that offsets all the human health and environmental damage. Now, when I say human health, we're tying this to Apollo study from Harvard and NASA that came out a couple years ago. Yep. They valued ammonia from agriculture at $100,000 per ton in human health costs yep. in the United States. So we're going to create mitigation banks out of manure lagoons, and we're proposing that Volkswagen offset all the environmental damage that they've done, the human health cost of which is $100,000 a ton. I they're like the idea. They're going to have to write a check either way. Yep. Why not have 80% well of that. it go to a positive yeah. PR campaign that saves their brand? The so only other thing that I would add to that is that I think that the agriculture uh, the big agricultural corporations have leaned pretty far forward, not just into greening their own operations, but to being advocates. So Unilever, Cargill, General Mills, Kellogg, Mars, the, Mars, the right. groups that you guys have assembled, I think yep. are leaning pretty far forward. And the more you can work with them and, and get them invested in this, I know the CEO of Cargill spends a lot of time going around to farmers trying to help them through some of this stuff. Right. So keep it. Keep it up. What this is, is the circular farm, and that borrows from Ellen MacArthur's <coughs> circular economy concept. Yep, we are the agricultural manifestation of that, and we want to transform corn belt farmland into organic status using organic fertilizer Great at work. scale. That's Great what we're work. in the middle of doing right now. Fantastic. And Thank I'd like so to much. be able to speak with you about that. You got it. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, in the back. Hello, Senator. Hello. Hello. Okay. Uh, I'm Julie Gordy from PAX. I was wondering, the, this 
whole effort to come up with a reasonable, rational climate policy that keeps us from catastrophe strikes me as a kind of whack-a-mole game where you, we start off with the argument of, well, it's not really happening, the science isn't worth it. And then the second argument was all, oh, it's the sun, it's solar radiation, that's causing it, it's not anthropogenic, we can't fix it. Now it seems to have moved on to other ground, and when we, did, when we got Kyoto, that was the ground of, well, we're, you know, China's going to be the biggest emitter, and then they became the biggest emitter, so we can't do anything until China does. Seems to me this has been an effort of sort of taking arrows out of the opposition quiver one by one. Is that an infinite quiver? Does that even help? Do they still use those arrows? Can you give me any insight on, you know, sort of we go with the main arguments that people are using, yeah. besides I am not a scientist, which is a fact. Most of them are. I think of it more like trench warfare. Sorry? I think of it more like trench warfare. Um, and their outermost trench is, this is a big old hoax. Well, they've had to completely abandon that trench and fall back to, well, the science is not that certain. They've actually had to abandon that trench and fall back to, well, actually, the science seems to show that there's a pause. There's a little bit left of few people left in the pause trench, but most have even abandoned that. And now they've gone to, this will kill our economy, and the Chinese aren't doing it. Well, the Chinese action has caused them to abandon that trench. So the positive sign is that it's a, it's, it's a, it's a retreat. And it's not quite a route yet, but it's a constant and steady retreat. You don't even hear the word hoax said on the Senate floor any longer. I believe because the Republicans have said to their colleagues who would still like to say that, don't you dare get out on the floor and say any more of that damn nonsense. That hurts all of us. Keep it to yourself. And that's a big change in and of itself, because they used to rush to the floor to talk about how this was a big old hoax. So Good sign. it's, the question is we're racing against a very unforgiving clock. Pope Francis, in my favorite phrase, says, you know, God always forgives. Mankind sometimes forgives. Nature never forgives. You slap her, she will slap you back. And we're racing against a very unforgiving clock. And that's the question is, can we push through in time? And that's why the series mission and the bicep mission and the opportunity in corporate lobbying as a, as a full phalanx from the Paris Coalition is so powerful. I think we have time for one more question. Hey, Senator Mark Besher with Unilever. Hey, you guys are terrific. Thank you. Yeah, Say hi to Paul. Terrific. We love you too. Lean, lean, lean. Keep yeah. it up. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I handle lobbying in DC for the company, and we go into a lot of offices with Ceres and, and some of the other others in the room. Uh, and beyond saying, hey, can your boss admit climate change is real? Uh, staffers typically say, all right, well, what do you want us to do about it? What are the solutions you want us to address? So beyond supporting renewables and the, the carbon tax concept, are there other pieces of legislation or regulations that we should be out there trying to get these offices to support? The, we've kind of moved beyond the original energy bill, and that got whittled down to very little by the time it passed. but. Clean energy issues are important. Equalizing the tax credits for wind and solar. We got five years for wind and solar, and a, unfortunately, geothermal and a bunch of other things fell off. We're trying to repair that. So there, there are bite-sized chunks that you can take that are less than diving all in that lets a cautious senator put his toe or his foot into the water first just to see how it is. But I would add one thing, and that is that the other side is not coming in and lobbying as if this were a civics class. They're telling campaign managers, your guy's dead to us if he doesn't do this. You cross us on this, you're done. And you don't have to be that much of a thug yourself but it is important to recognize that that's the tone of a lot of the conversation coming from the other side. And so it is important for this community to say, look, we get what you're up against. And when they come at you, 
we will do everything we can to have your back. Turn the question around. What can we do? Who can we bring together in your state to make this a comfortable move for you? Because we like you, we want you to win next time, we want to have your back, we understand the threat that's being posed to you, and we want to be there for you. If this is like a graduate seminar in carbon, they still have the upper hand. Well, thank you so much. And that Can I make one last action. point before yes, we go? Because it, has, it hasn't come do. up, and that Absolutely. is um, oceans. The denial outfit loves to go to the complexities of computer climate modeling and how all the variabilities play out in different segments of the measurements in various levels of the troposphere. And go to the oceans. 93% of the heat went into the oceans. You can measure the resulting warming with a thermometer, and people have. Go to the shores where, unless you're going to repeal the law of thermal expansion, sea levels are rising. And you measure that basically with a yardstick, and people have, including the Navy. Any school that has an aquarium takes pH tests, and you know what's happening in the ocean to our acidity, and we're seeing these incredibly frightening, dramatic things happening, like the die-off of the bulk of the Great Barrier Reef and the collapse of the Northwest Pacific pteropod population. These are not nothings. These are huge screams from nature of warning, and they're very hard for the denial crowd to counter because they haven't, they pick the fight where there's confusion. So we should pick the fight where there isn't. So make sure that in your advocacy that oceans is a piece of it, because it's very, very hard to deny. And then you pick up a lot of people along these coasts. Bear in mind that from Norfolk to Jacksonville, every single coastal community in those southern states voted and came out against offshore drilling. And the groups that assembled for that are still politically strong. And oceans is a valuable issue in a lot of these places. So don't forget our seas. We certainly won't. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Seven White House.